let's get this party started. Let's go to Hebrews 3. Let's go to Hebrews 3. Oh, yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right, you guys. Hebrews 3. We're going to start in um, verse 7. It says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of temptation in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said they will always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Verse 12, be attentive brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that you depart from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence firmly to the end while it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not Pardon your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were they who heard and rebelled? Was it not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he grieved for 40 years? Was it not with those who had sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who disobeyed? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So tonight I want to um, just kind of hone in on this whole thing. You know, we've talked about before, Kyle has said how he talks about how this evil heart of unbelief and um you know, we're always believing something and this unbelief is not basically like not believing, but it's basically believing something other than what God has spoken to us in his word. Um, so I just want to go and give an example since they're talking about, hey, he's talking about the Israelites in the wilderness, how they were there for 40 years. You know, God said, Hey, look, I've given you this land of plenty. It's prosperous. It's houses you didn't build. It's full of milk and honey and all this stuff. The only thing is, is they had to go in there and take it over. And, you know, the Israelites went, they spied out the land and, there were 12 spies and 10 came back with an unbelieving evil report. And it was Joshua and Caleb that said, look, we can take it. You know, they came back believing what God had said to them. Yeah, it is everything he said, and we are well able to take it. But the other 10 spies said, no, you know, we are like grasshoppers in their sight. And so we're grasshoppers in our sight. And so we are in their sight. And, and so they were in this wilderness for 40 years because the Israelites believed 
the word of that unbelief. See, it was the unbelief that said opposite of what God had told them. And, you know, it, let's go to um, Exodus 14. And we'll just kind of like take a look and see, um, you know, exactly kind of the progression of this. Okay, so let's go to um, Exodus 14. And, um, you know, this is right after uh, the Israelites were delivered out of Egypt. Um, they had seen all the amazing works that God had done, you know, all the plagues. I mean, it's crazy, you guys. If you read this, it's like all these plagues hit Egypt. And even it talks about how there was darkness all in Egypt, but in the land of Goshen was still light. It's like they were in this bubble of protection from all this evil that came on the Egyptians. And um, so they are now about to cross the Red Sea. And uh, let's see. Let's start in verse 10. So they're at the Red Sea and it says, four, verse 10, when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and indeed the Egyptians were marching after them and they were extremely terrified so that the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, it is because there were no, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. So it's like they just saw all these miracles of God deliver them. And now they're, they're, they're like blaming Moses and God for bringing them out. And they're saying, look, we would have better been better off staying in that bondage. They think that they're going to die instead of seeing the goodness of God like come through for them again like he did when they were still in Egypt and verse 13 says but Moses said to the people fear not stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord which he will show you today for the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall never see again. The Lord shall fight for you while you hold your peace. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Speak to the children of Israel so that they go forward. See, he's saying they wanted to go back, man. They wanted to go back into bondage. And God is saying, speak to them that they will go forward. See, God always wants us to be moving forward, to be progressing, to be increasing in our lives. He never wants us to be moving backwards. And if that's happening in our lives, I just declare right now that there will be no moving backwards in the name of Jesus, that we will progressively be going forward, that we will be trusting the Lord God to continue to move us forward, progressing, succeeding in everything that we do. He says, and for you, lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. Then the children of Israel shall go over on dry ground through the midst of the sea. As for me, surely I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians 
so that they shall follow them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh, through all his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. So God's saying, do something, <laughs> do something, stretch out your hand. You know, we, we talk about faith without that corresponding, just action, just like in James says, is dead. We have to have that corresponding action that shows we're trusting God. We're moving forward. We're, we're, we're walking and moving in what he says. And God is saying, stretch forth your hand. So Moses did that. And it says, um, let's go down to verse 21 says, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land so that the waters were divided. The children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground and the waters were a wall unto them on their right and on their left. Wow. <sighs> See, God always upholds his word. He said, do this and I will do this. Hey, Chase. And I will do this. So that, so they crossed over and, um, you know, the Egyptians got swallowed up in the sea and the Israelites walked over and they if we go into chapter 15 they started singing praises to God thanking him and and then uh, you know praising him and then shortly after it's like they were if we go to verse chapter 15 verse 22 he's talking about um, you know, they were is in the Israel in the wilderness for three days and found no water. And it says in verse 24, so the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he said, If you diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will not afflict you any of the diseases I will have afflicted the Egyptians for I am the Lord who heals you. See though, it's like, and if you read through Exodus, it's, it's this constant, you know, Hebrews warned us. He said, don't be like the Egyptians who consistently murmured and complained and had this evil heart of unbelief. And, you know, um, it's like time and time again, they, they continue to do this. And I've been reading through the Old Testament and um, even in Jeremiah, man, you know, I'm amazed at the goodness of God and how he consistently came through for Israel and they constantly complained and griped about this and that and you know it got to the point where in Jeremiah uh they ended up going into captivity for 70 years. And, but then it says, they went into this captivity for 70 years and then it 
the Lord promised them to bring him out. Okay, so if we go to Jeremiah 29, so they go into captivity again. So, you know, you got the Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years, then they finally get in to the promised land after 40 years and they, um, you know, take over this land and they're living. But it's like this consistent thing where they are continually turning and rebelling against the Lord and griping and complaining. And, but man, God is so faithful that he continues to bring them out. And it says, Jeremiah 29, 11, or 29, 10 says, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans for peace and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you shall call on me and you shall come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity <laughs> and gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back into the place where I caused you to be carried away captive. And I guess... You know, Jeremiah 29, 11, we hear all the time, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And it really hit me reading through Jeremiah because we hear that all the time, but in the context of it all, they were in captivity because of their rebellion and unbelief and and. It's amazing to me that when we, even when we choose to try and do our own thing, because really, you know, all the Old Testament is here for us to learn from. We don't ever want to like cancel out the old covenant and the old Testament thinking, oh, we're, we're under the new covenant under grace and all that is great. Yes. But we still want to learn what not to do. And we see they turn their backs on God and they started trying to do things on their own and serving idols and the flesh and griping and complaining and and turning their back on Moses who was like the prophet in their life who was trying to bring them into that wealthy place teaching them hey God wants you to prosper and they ended up in bondage again and again and again from their own decisions and their own actions. But yet here God is, he's like, look, I know these plans I have for you. And yes, you've put yourself in this bondage place <coughs> in this place of captivity, because it's like, you know, we see even in the New Testament, God talks about how, you know, they turned their hearts away from God. And so he had to turn them over. And here he is, he's saying, I know the plans I have for you. I have this place of peace and not of evil, like I, I want you to follow my word and what I'm instructing you to do. 
because this plan I have for you is perfect. You know, he says in third, third John verse two, beloved, I wish above all else. I wish above all else that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And he's saying, if you will seek me, if you will come to me, I will turn you from your captivity. I will bring you into that place of abundance. I will bring you in that place where I I know I have this perfect plan for you. And, you know, I just think of Jesus and all he did was surrender himself to the Father. He didn't gripe and complain about, oh God, all these people are against me or, you know, why don't they believe what I'm saying? Um, he never did that. He, he said, look, I'm not here on my own. The things that I do is not me. It is the father in me that does the works. And I guess what I'm trying to say in all of this is, you know, when we yield ourselves to the Lord, even when we've totally turned our backs on him and tried to do it our way, he's still there. He says, I stand at the door and knock. You know, it says Psalm 106, 25, or even 24, says they dis then they despised the pleasant land they did not believe his promise but they grumbled in their tents and did not listen to the voice of the lord and you know i grumbled and complained about my job about you know stuff at home i'm like god why 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 is this happening complaining about this at the job but you know Kyle's told the story before how he started doing that at his job griping and complaining about this or that and and the Lord said you are cursing your blessing and and you know the Lord really spoke to me about that lately too he's like you're you're cursing your blessing like he cannot prosper me and advance me until I start being thankful. And, you know, um, Jesus humbled himself. John, of course we know this one. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he do, does not believe is condemned already. And I don't know if this is really coming off the way that I wanted it to, you guys, but you know, I just see this love that God has for us, that he is just constantly chasing us down. And he's saying, I have this 
plan for your life. I am your healer. I am your deliverer. I am your safe place. And he just wants to restore us and bring us to that place of intimacy with him. You know, just knowing him. But the only way we can know him is through the word. He is the word. Just like Kyle was saying a couple of weeks ago, like when we read the word, he said, my words are spirit and my words are life. So when we read this word, he is coming into our spirit and he is filling us with his words. He is filling us with his spirit. He is filling us with his life and when we yield to that when we submit to him James 4 7 says submit yourselves therefore to God let's go there real quick James James Peter John after Hebrews is James Peter John James 4 7 Therefore, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to dejection. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. See, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. So when we submit ourselves to this word, he's saying, Look, don't grumble and complain. You know, just like Hebrew said, he's like, look, be aware. <laughs> don't, don't do what they did. But, you know, Philippians says, think on these things that are pure and lovely. And <sighs> if there be any good thing, think on this, think on these things. Because he wants us to enjoy this beautiful life that he has prepared for us but the only way is for us to get into this word to renew our minds to see his word is life his word is life his word is medicine to our to our bodies and life to our bodies. It is cleansing. It is, it washes us clean. It, it purifies our hearts. It, it brings us prosperity. It brings us joy and peace. And, you know, when we walk in that, we will see the goodness of God, the goodness of God. It's him that does the works in us. And I guess, I guess what I'm saying is let's, let's just totally give ourselves over to the word, what it says, what he says to us. Let's, what if we just completely surrendered ourselves um, Andrew Murray has a book on humility. You guys, it's so good. And um, really, you know, when we try getting into our doing what we think it's right is pride. I guess pride, humility, re 
or pride, unbelief, rebellion. It's all the same. But Jesus came and he submitted himself. I mean, you guys think about that? Jesus submitted himself unto death. He obeyed the Father unto death. Submission is what defeated the devil. He said, submit yourselves to God and he will flee. Jesus submitted himself unto death and destroyed every work of the enemy. See, when we submit, when we yield ourselves to the word, that is what, that is what breaks the power of the enemy over our lives. So if you are struggling with anything right now, wondering If you're wondering, God, where are you? Where are you in this situation? Where are you? He's he's in the word <laughs> and he's there. And if we just yield ourselves to it, he will show himself faithful. You will see the goodness of God, whether it's financial, health, healing, mental I mean, whatever it is, he is there and he will see you through it. I just want to, um, I, I just want to read this little um, excerpt from Andrew Murray's humility book. It says, We need only think for a moment what faith is. Is it not the confession of nothingness and helplessness, the surrender and the waiting to let God work? Is it not in itself the most humbling thing there can be? The acceptance of our place as dependents who can claim or get or do nothing but what grace bestows. Humility is simply the disposition which prepares the soul for living on trust. And every, even the most secret breathing of pride in self-seeking, self-will, self-confidence, or self self-exaltation is just the strengthening of that self which cannot enter the kingdom or possess the things of the kingdom because it refuses to allow God to be what he is and must be the all and all pride renders faith impossible and what is the opposite of pride but humility? He said, humbling ourselves, saying, God, I can do nothing. I am of myself, just like Jesus. I of myself can do nothing. But let's not get stuck there. He said, I of myself can do nothing. But then, the word also says, in Christ, all things are possible. In, in the word, in when we surrender, when we say, God, have everything of me. <laughs> When we become like Jesus, and surrender our all to the Father, He said, "Father, He even struggled. He struggled 
to want to find a different way. He's like, if there is any other way, take this from me. But yet he also knew that there was no other way. And so he completely trusted the father. I mean, I can't imagine that trust. <laughs> giving his life, giving his life, knowing just like Abraham knew he sacrificed Isaac, knowing that God would raise him from the ashes if he had to. And Jesus had such trust and such faith in the Father that he gave his life. And the Father came through. He came through. And in that absolute surrender, that absolute submission and trust to the Father, to what he said, he was raised back to life. The Holy Spirit went down and brought him back up and defeated every work of the enemy. Every work of the enemy, I declare, has been defeated in your life right now in the name of Jesus. You will no longer be bound by that thing that you've been struggling with. And I declare freedom over you right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you gave every bit of yourself an absolute surrender. And Father, I ask that you would show us how to do the same. Lord, help us get into your word and to surrender ourselves to your word, to your love, trusting your love, trusting your word that you have. You know the plans that you have for us. You said they are plans to prosper us and give us hope, to give us hope. You know those plans. Lord, help us to surrender to you, to your word. Lord, I thank you. In Jesus' name, I thank you for your word. I declare life over every one of us, Lord, that we are walking into a new level with you, that we are walking into a new level of submission to your word, trusting you, a new level of trust in you, Lord, a new level of faith in your word, that even when the pressure comes on us, that we stay committed to your word, Lord, that we don't bow down to the unbelief or the fear or the rebellion or the complaining or the the negativity, but we stay on that word that you said that we are more than conquerors, Lord, that you said everything our hand touches prospers. Lord, you said everything, every place that our foot treads, you gave us that land, Lord, in our jobs, in our homes, everything we touch succeeds. Everything our hand touches prospers, Lord, and we thank you. Lord, we stand on that word that no matter what comes our way, we stand on your word, Lord. We thank you for your word, that your word is truth, that your word is life, and I speak blessing over everyone at the sound of my voice, Lord, that you are taking us into new ground, 
new ground this year, Lord, breaking new ground in Jesus' name, prospering new levels of prosperity, new levels of success in Jesus' name, new levels of health in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for it. I bless you for it. I bless everyone in the name of Jesus. I, Guys, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of this, for being a part of this journey with us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. We love you. Oh, we, I just bless you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You guys have a great week. I bless you. Thank you for sticking with me. I felt like... Man, I feel like I'm all over the place, you guys, but God is so good. And this is the year of breakthrough. Everything that you've been fighting for, this is it. This is the year. So thank you. Guys, have a great week. I'll send you the link if you guys want to tune in to the services this week. You're awesome. Be blessed and we'll see you next week.